welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Uh, my name is Glenn Taransky. I am a member of the advisory board here at One Business World, the host platform for uh, Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest in industry developments. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased to welcome leading global executive and entrepreneur, Thomas Costable. Tom is the executive director and CEO of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers is a not-for-profit membership organization that enables uh, collaboration, knowledge, and sharing, and skills development across all engineering disciplines. At ASME, Tom and his team help the global engineering community develop a solutions develop solutions to real-world challenges. Founded in 1880 as the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME is a not-for-profit professional organization that enables collaboration, knowledge sharing, and skill development across all engineering disciplines while promoting the vital role of the engineer in society. ASME codes and standards, publications, conferences, continuing education and professional development programs provide a foundation for advancing technical knowledge and a safer world. Tom, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Good morning. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing on your topic, embracing complexity as we prepare for the next 100 years. So let me hand it off to you and I'll be back with you on the, uh, on the backside of the, uh, of the presentation. Well, great, Glenn, thank you. <clears throat> and again, thank you for inviting ASME and, uh, and myself to attend today. So we've uh, prepared a short presentation. Let me uh, share my screen. So as Glenn said, I'm uh, Tom Costabile. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. I want to thank all of you for joining me today as we discuss the growing complex nature of doing business and how we can prepare for future success. Over the past few years, we've all seen a rapid acceleration of digital transformation. Companies has had to be nimble and had to adapt quickly to an ever-changing world. The one thing that I've learned personally from COVID is that whatever decisions you make today, you need to be prepared to update and change tomorrow. At ASME, we have not been immune to this new reality, but we innovate <clears throat> thinking and diversifying our portfolio. I'm confident we are on the right path to ensure a long and sustainable future. So as the premier resource for mechanical engineers around the world, ASME has a mission. It's very simple, advanced engineering for the benefit of humanity. ASME is a fairly complex organization that works with global engineering community to develop solutions to real world challenges. As you can see in this simple chart, there are three rectangular boxes. They encompass 11 different business units plus the ASME foundation. Together, ASME accounts for more than 90,000 members around the world. And what I'm most excited about is about 34,000 of them are students still working on their engineering education. We have thousands of volunteers from over 135 countries. We have several offices in the United States, uh, New York, New Jersey, Washington, DC, and Houston, as well as staff offices in Europe and in both South and East Asia. ASME's digital library is now one of the greatest resources available anywhere in the world for mechanical engineering knowledge and expertise. It includes over 207,000 technical papers and more than 1.6 million pages of technical content. And thanks to digital transformation, uh, this vast amount of <clears throat> information is, <clears throat> excuse me, is accessible via our website at www.asme.org. I'd be remiss also if I didn't mention that we now, ASME now trains over 10,000 people annually in the use of these standards, all designed to keep people safe. ASME is proud to be a leader in the creation of standards. There are four here shown typically. These are our most four popular standards. ASME creates and maintains approximately 500 different standards. The ASME standards are recognized and accepted in the active use in over 100 countries. The yellow uh, standard shown here is our most popular. It's the ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code followed by our elevator code for <clears throat> safety code for elevators and escalators. You all use those devices every day. 
And our two other most popular ones are the self-erecting cranes and dimensioning and tolerance. These standards cover a breadth of topics. They include pressure technology, nuclear power plants, as I mentioned, elevators and escalators, construction, engineering, design, standardization, and more importantly, performance testing. Recent efforts are working to provide guidance to industries such as additive manufacturing, model-based enterprise, robotics, storage energy, and mobile unmanned systems. I'd like to take a few minutes to share some of the key trends impacting our constituents and the industries that they represent. It is well known now and accepted that the data is reshaping every part of industry across our globe. Asset intensive industries have always produced lots of data. However, this data has often been siloed and it's difficult to automate. And more importantly, it's never been used to improve the bottom line. However, with the continued evolution of technology, we are seeing a new digital first era that is looking towards integration and connectivity to break down walls across product life cycles. Organizations are looking to eliminate long-standing inefficiencies, produce timely insights for key shareholders, and to help maintain and manage growing customer expectations. The demand for new types of solutions is fantastic. As more parts of the industrial enterprise become digitally connected, organizations who have traditionally been hardware centric must start to become data centric as they look to transform their business models to meet the shifting customer preferences. Today, computer skills are necessary for most workers in an organization. In the near future, we will see skills that leverage the power of AI augmentation just to be ubiquitous to maintain competitiveness. Leading industrial organizations realize the need to change. And at ASME, we are positioning ourselves to be an essential resource to ensure their success. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in an area of convergence. Technology capabilities are rapidly increasing. Access to powerful analytic and simulation tools are shifting experimentation to the virtual realm, <clears throat> excuse me, virtual reality using digital twins. Market conditions and customer requirements are rapidly changing, requiring new levels of organizational transparency and agility. Supply chain disruptions, we've all experienced them, are causing organizations to rethink their geographic footprint and strategically address their vulnerabilities. Leading organizations are transitioning their business models from selling assets to selling capabilities. Examples include jet engine efficiency, farm equipment uptime, and creating virtual factories, which match product demand with available capacity with just a few keystrokes. Sustainability is becoming a key issue with customers, increasing demand that their value chain aligns with the ethos of their organization. While the interest in industrial transformation continues to grow, the road to success is challenging. There is no fixed recipe for success. Organizations on this journey are having to embrace a culture of experimentation and data-driven thinking that has not traditionally existed in the industrial base. At ASME, we are undergoing our own digital transformation to ensure that we have the ability and agility to operate at the speed of our market and to respond to the dynamic conditions that are likely here to stay for some time. Transformation is no longer an option. It is a requirement for future relevancy. But as we all know, change is never easy. I'd like to discuss a bit about the individuals who will lead this journey and why we are confident mechanical engineers who represent the core of our engineering community are ready for this challenge. Despite all the focus around data science, domain knowledge of industrial systems remains critical to the scalable transformation of success. The digital engineering path for mechanical engineers will equip them with a blend of computer science, data analytics, and domain, domain expertise to build effective artificial intelligence tools. Because of their diverse technical skill sets, the proverbial jack of all trades, the mechanical engineer, are well positioned to effectively across these different <clears throat> areas. The future of machine learning and data science will involve a deep connection with physics. The more we want to apply machine learning to real world problems, 
the more we will need people with domain expertise who know the intricacies of dynamic systems. To build a value creating virtual world, you need individuals who have intimate knowledge of reality. I'd like to discuss for a few seconds the eight hurdles at ASME and the stages that we are and the steps that we are taking to ensure that we remain the go to resource for the industrial community. As with any organization, our sister organizations, we have numerous challenges. Some of these are unique to the association space, while others pertain to traditional revenue streams, product development, and the threat of digital disruption. All of these are likely shared by our sister organizations. One notable concern shared by many is incorporation by reference or IBR. Essentially with IBR, it states that if standard is if a standard is written by the federal law and the standard development body can no longer charge a fee for that standard. At ASME, the revenue source that has allowed us to do the amazing things for over 140 years for the engineering community has traditionally been heavily subsidized by our standard sales. The looming risk of IBR has made us realize that we need to change and change rather quickly. Thus, what we have taken is a look at how we can diversify our offerings to meet our customers' demands. I'd like to share three recent launched for-profit entities that are helping us to de-risk our legacy revenue model. First is Metrics. Metrics is an integrated events and content, content platform for engineers and technical professionals focused on digital transformation in industries from aerospace and automotive to energy, medical, and more. Second is Twinify Technologies, which enables industry clients to gain real-time value-driven analytic insights from the asset level to the portfolio level through a digital twin solution. And the last is simply a marketplace for technical standards, and that's Textry. We have also launched an enterprise-wide digital transformation effort to build a strategy around analytics, which allows us to measure customer and constituent engagements to ensure we deploy organizational resources where they are most needed. Our culture and workforce transformation task force is actively acquiring feedback from employees to ensure our transition to a new hybrid work model, yielding mutually beneficial results and improving employee, the, the quality of life for our employees. As we have launched the strategy and innovation office to identify and coordinate and drive market opportunities at an accelerated pace. We're just at the start of a journey, but I'm confident on a path to success. <clears throat> we are setting up ASME to be relevant for many, many years to come, all in the digital transformation world. If there's anything that I can be certain of in this ever-changing global landscape is that change is persistent. Embracing that change and a digital first world is the only way to ensure that all of our organizations are around for the next 100 years. Again, we're advancing <clears throat> engineering for the benefit of humanity, and we're providing safety standards on a global basis. So Glenn, I want to thank you all for again and asking me to, to join today. Uh, I'd be glad to answer a few uh, questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Some of the uh, some of the things you talk about a lot a lot of it being the novice and the non engineer <laughs> on the uh, in the meeting. Uh, a lot of the stuff you take for granted, like you said, from a safety standpoint, like like elevators and escalators and things like that. Um, I was uh, so it, it it's sometimes you know the the engine the engineering world strikes me as it's it's the type of thing where it's sometimes it's under the covers, right? The assumption is well, of course. Of course, it's going to be solid and 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 perfect. Uh, we're all, we're all counting on it for, for for sure as you go as you go through. You know, it's interesting though. You the the organization as as you look at as you look at uh, digitization coming coming across the landscape as well. Um, you're certainly not sitting 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 by. Uh, you're being you're being very proactive in getting in getting out there and up, and updating kind of on on your mission and how you how you go about it. How how closely do you work with uh, you know I've done I've done an, I'm on the board of my college uh, and we have an engineering program as well. I was gonna, how 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 much work do you do with the with the schools in looking at curriculum and trainings and getting and getting students ready for the next the next generation of, of engineers? 
Well, uh, since I'm a dyed in wool New Yorker, my cynic response is not enough. But we, we quite frankly, it's a great question. Uh, we do quite a lot. And what, what ASME has done best for years uh, has been that neutral third party convener. So um, I went to school in New York City, Manhattan College. Um, I'm very active on campus. I've always, ha always have been. Uh, but we deal, that's one of the greatest parts about my job is that we deal with most of all engineering schools across the United States and globally. Um, somebody has an idea. Uh, traditionally, you know, the, uh, the <clears throat> academics don't like to share that idea as they're developing it. And then we're writing a paper on it. But now what we're seeing, especially through COVID, is much more collaboration. We're getting quicker results. We're getting more information out there. And as a result of it, we're improving the whole process. So when I speak about digital twin, you know, traditionally, and I am a mechanical engineer, traditionally, I would see the ability to model on a computer certain types of pumps, fans, valves that you would buy and put this all together. I just recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who runs a very large hedge fund. They have a digital twin model on how they manage their assets. So if you think of it in terms of replacing a pump with a certain company with at that's typically asset bound. How do I know how cash is moving quickly? And I can do this via a model that says, now I have the ability to sell this asset at this particular gain to be able to invest in something else. And you're seeing a lot more of that happening in the world. The average engineer in that space does not think of the applications outside of the different devices that you're, you're dealing with. And then, as you said, you put it back into the college environment or the university environment, with some brilliant, brilliant individuals at the, the master's and PhD levels, the, the ability to streamline the thinking and also improve the efficiency of it is just amazing. I'm just glad to be a small part of it. When you, uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, the twinning piece, you, you always think about uh, when you change systems or, or you update systems, the whole concept of, of running parallel, right? In the old the old way of thinking, it would be you know you have you have the old system and the new system coming up, and what an interesting way to to, to kind of track performance to have it as a as a digital type of parallel kind of system when you when when you think about it talk about talk about an extra an extra security security blanket as it as it goes through what type of um, you know from a talent standpoint what type of uh, students are you seeing uh, coming into the program I mean are, are they are they dyed in wool engineers do you see them coming in perhaps more along the lines of, say, a, a business or a science background, all of a sudden it, it kind of turns that way? Is, are, are, they, are they immediately you know, focused on this is what I want to do? Do you, see, do you see that developing over time? I have, and I, I can tell you that it's a conversation I've seen even through the multitude of virtual meetings that we've held with the different colleges and universities through COVID. Um, our student population today is one of the most diverse populations that I've seen. Uh, the ability to attract more females into the engineering world is, is happening. Uh, there's more collaboration between the business side of it versus the uh, versus the true engineering science side of it. Now, I personally believe that we need more engineers and we need more scientists in the world and less attorneys at this particular point. Now, I know I'll get some feedback on that, but the reason I say that is it's oh, the... Look, the chat box just filled up. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's, and it's most of it is the attorneys that I deal with on a daily basis. But, <laughs> but no, the reason I say that is that the ability to innovate and, and to bring new products to fruition. I, I look at some of our 34,000 student members. The group that's, that are now uh, sophomores and juniors in, in engineering school, the jobs that they will take in one to two years have not been created, created yet or thought of. That happens through innovation today. Um, I look at uh, some of the stuff that SpaceX is doing or, or Tesla. Uh, I know Elon Musk shares an, shares an opinion that we need more, more scientists out there. The ability to innovate and you know, do things much more cost-effective and repeatable. The one thing that uh, he has accomplished through SpaceX is the repeated use of, uh, of booster rockets. So instead of one and done, uh, that all translates into a cost stream and a cost revenue breakdown. That, whether it's reimbursed by the government or it's something that the share shareholders have to pick up, it's one that you can now model and say, okay, we know that this particular device is gonna be good for at least three or four or five different turns. That reduces substantially your cost to deliver a, uh, a satellite or deliver a package into space. It's that thinking that I'm seeing coming out of it. So the traditional engineer, whether it's a mechanical, electrical, chemical, or biomechanical engineer, 
those walls and those silos are being broken down. Now it's all interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. How do I collaborate? My favorite topic, um, I live on a ranch in, uh, in Texas and my favorite topic are drones. So when you look at it in terms of inspecting or we're going out and taking a look at uh, what's happened even with uh, a lot of the uh, farm animals that are out there. You could do that by, with a drone now and you do it while you're sitting in your office or you're sitting on the back porch instead of driving around for five or six hours and you're done in 15 minutes and if there's an issue, you've got, to, you've got a crew out there right away. It's that type of technology that takes the interdisciplinary approach of, I need a computer science individual. I need somebody from the electric world. I need a mechanical engineer. And then, oh, by the way, you know, material sciences and, and what are we gonna do with this? Um, there's many, many different uses for materials engineers and industrial engineers. Uh, the average person doesn't think about what that little drone does. So. T typical typical program, four years or, or three plus two, how does it work? It, it's all over the place, Glenn, and it depends upon the uh, it depends upon the institution. Manhattan College is, is a four year program for your for your BA your BS degree. Uh, Columbia University, some brilliant brilliant robotics people coming out of Columbia. Um, they actually have a program that's uh, you know you can do three years at a community college and then two years at, at Columbia. Um, some of my favorites are five-year programs, a lot of the West Coast schools. Five years, you come out with a master's degree in, uh, in mechanical engineering. Um, the, uh, the part that uh, I get this question just about every time I, I meet with a student group, what would you recommend? Should I continue for my master's degree or should I, you know, should I go to work for a while? And I said, in my, I can't give you the advice on that because I don't know the bigger picture. But I will tell you, there's so much changing out there today, getting a little bit of a taste of what's happening in industry uh, for a year or two, you'll better position yourself. And unlike uh, our careers, today the average individual stays with the company maybe three or four years. Uh, to stay for 20 years is unheard of, completely unheard of. Um, and how do you do that? You know, both my brother and my son are mechanical engineers. So there's a little bit of engineering running in the family. Uh, my son is a, a, a 2005 graduate from uh, UC San Diego, and he's now had six different positions in six different companies. So uh, wow. continued growth. When you um, when you look at you look at the typical student progressing, uh, and I think I think internships are always are always helpful. Uh, and when you think about it, and as and as a society, that's where I think you could you could probably be so helpful with just all of your industry connections through the membership, I would think that and I, I think I think most professionals and I know myself included, really enjoy working with students and trying to help them to kind of discover discover their own passion as, as it goes through. How, how, how engaged do you find your membership with, with, with uh, working with young young people? Uh, very engaged. We've got several and, and thanks for asking that question because I share your passion. Um, if you, we have several, we have um, a little over 300 professional sections. And what we have is a toolkit that really puts the professional sections with our 800 plus student sections. And the ability to sit and talk uh, or to mentor, uh, we're now starting with our K through 12 STEM program. We, we have a program that's called Drop Me In. Uh, Drop Me In is, uh, is meant to just uh, expose engineering sciences to uh, the K through 12 group. Uh, we're doing doing a, a lot of that program in conjunction with uh, Discovery Education. We partnered with Discovery to do that. So the goal is to uh, talk about mechanical engineering and engineering sciences to a million students over a three-year period. And we're well off on the, to achieve that. Then you jump up into the uh, in college environment. Uh, there's one thing I've learned with students to get them to come to a, a, a lecturer meeting. You use the two F words, free food. If you have free food at an event that everybody shows up, the questions don't stop. It's, it's unbelievable. And you no, if it was an accounting audience, it would have to be free CPE, but <laughs> you're doing education credits, right? You're right. You're right. So, but uh, your point is well taken. How do you inspire that, that individual sitting in a classroom trying to decide you know, what to do? I, I really have a life and, and I love music, but you can pursue both. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that, uh, if you look at just the engineering sciences that go into development of any type of a musical instrument, it's, it's tremendous. I was asked just recently about, uh, I, somebody had said to me, a student had said to me, I, I was wondering how many engineers actually produce, are involved in producing the Super Bowl? 
And if you stop and think, a typical Super Bowl takes about four to 500 individuals in the background to produce that. But from the stage setup to the stage design to the, the electronics that have to come in and out of the, of the program, it's several hundred engineers that work you know, five to six months putting that whole program together, but you never see one, all of it, all you see is the talent on the stage. And when it's, it's, it's success, nobody gets hurt, it's, it's wonderful. We all did our jobs. Right. Well, you know, it's the old, it's the old story. It's, it's the behind the scenes piece. And when your, your adulation is when things go, go off without a hitch. Right. And Correct. it just, it just shows that it otherwise works through. Hey, a little bit about your standard setting. Uh, how, again, I'm, a, I'm an accountant, so I, I understand the standard setting process is often grueling and it, and it takes a long, long time. And you go through a lot of different sometimes drafting sessions, uh, public comment periods. Just curious on the engineering world. Does, does it does it kind of work the same way? It does. Um, you know, today an average standard takes between three and five years to develop brand new. Um, our code, our, our boiler code, which is a little over nineteen thousand pages, if you were to print it, uh, we have a group that uh, we have a group of volunteers, about uh, six thousand individuals, all told. Um, they the group meets actively. Um, four times a year to review case you know, code case uh, issues, to review different uh, inquiries on interpretation. What did you mean when you had this particular set of criteria? Uh, if you look at some of the uh, tables that we, re re we reference in the code book, uh, how are they peri periodically updated? So what we have is we call it boiler code week. Uh, typically it's about 250 meetings that run concurrently over an eight day period, uh, four times a year. Uh, through COVID, we switched that all to virtual. And now what we're doing is we're coming out. We just had our first in-person meeting in New Orleans in, uh, in May to, to bring the group back together at least twice a year and to figure out how do we do more together to keep doing that. It's an update. The, the challenge that we see in front of us is that with technology changing about every 180 days, to, de to develop a standard for robotics, you can't wait five years because that standard will be outdated the first time you publish it. How do we get that information out? What methodology do we use? Uh, do we continue to use the uh, ANSI uh, standardization process? So a lot of that's in the industry right now being discussed by the team of experts that uh, develop these standards every day. I myself have been involved in standards development uh, since I got out of college in 1975. And it's something that for me to stay relevant in my continuing education with uh, engineering, uh, I felt great. So 10 years later, uh, 1985, I jumped out of engineering, got into the business world, and I was always the architect of a deal. And coming back into it now, it's interesting because the, uh, so much has changed in the, in, in, since I was using standards, and, but the concept and the ability to standardize something, sell that to a group out there, brings a product to commercialization a lot quicker. So if you look at the commercial side of it, uh, being an accountant, you can appreciate that. And I need to spend a hundred million to develop this product. Well, my first question is, what's the payback? How soon can I start selling it? And, and that's what I've seen more and more of today. The other interesting part is my other favorite topic I like to talk about is you had mentioned early on our standards and for safety. We do a lot behind the scenes with construction equipment as well. And, and my favorite being a New Yorker, my favorite is the high cranes that we see all over our city. So typically an inspection crew would spend a week, five, six, 10 people climbing this, you know, 1,000, 1,200 foot crane. You can now inspect that with a drone and send the crew up to, if there's a spot that you pick up on, this is, you can send a crew up immediately to take care of it. Uh, it's interesting since we've developed this, this philosophy and the industry is now using this, there have been many, many fewer accidents that are out there. It's a, another quiet behind the scenes type stuff that goes on. No, that's, 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 that's amazing. Uh, you know, and you, in, as you said, you kind of embed, you embed the, the technology into the process, whether, it, whether it's drones or, or artificial intelligence or yep. virtual, maybe virtual reality, augmented reality. It, 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 it really is fascinating. It, it really winds up becoming a blend of, of really all of these technological innovations and sciences all kind of coming together at the, at the same spot with, with, with your engineers kind of at kind of at the hub kind of in the, kind of at the communicore if you will and kind of branching branching there out what, what do you think's next what 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 i mean i mean you think about 
you look back on your career and you think about, you said every 180 days it's changing. What don't we know yet that's coming next? Well, what, do you, what do you think? The big, the biggest thing that we have to embrace as a global engineering community is climate change. And we've got a, we've got a transition. And we're all seeing different weather patterns because of it. So in clean energy uh, is, is number one on our radar screen for the next two years. How do we facilitate more of those types of conversations? And then followed by more you know, AI that's built into the devices that we're using. Um, the, uh, you know, being an engineer, you give me data, I could solve any problem. So now how do I share that information uh, openly and freely? And then how do we make the world a, a better place? We have to get a handle on that. You know, shortly, we're going to have to help <clears throat> Europe rebuild itself. Uh, how do we rebuild it most effectively? The tools are there. The standards are there. Uh, ASME, uh, right up until December of um, 2021, we had a team working with the Ukraine on developing standards for power reactors. So that part, that's all going to come back quickly as well. But those are the, th those are the three things, the th two things that are there. And I had one more for my third option is sustainability. Everything that we're doing now, we have to have more of, a, more of a focus on sustainability. Clean water, clean energy, a clean food supply chain. Uh, if you look at the 17 different sustainability goal, goals that the UN has published, uh, that has to be front focused more and it has to go across the board. Well, funny, funny you mentioned that. Uh, uh, I'm having dinner tonight with one of the board members of the UN Global Compact. Uh, He's he's a he's a Holy Cross priest from Notre Dame, and he uh, sits on the King's College board. Next, uh, and our names match up, so I've I've gotten to know him quite well. And and he he's always talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and you and you look at some of what's there. It starts off with you know eradicate poverty, and and as you said, clean yep. water, clean air, you know, uh, kind of stuff that you just you take for granted. But that with with your help and your society's help, you could you could embed all of that into kind of the way, not only the way we think, but but the procedures, the, the controls, the standards, the coding, it, it all it all it all makes for a for a, a safer and healthier world for sure down down the line. And you guys are doing some really, really great work, cutting edge work. You know, and, and you need you need professional societies. You need to be able you need to be that hub where where your engineers can come to for advice, for help, for counsel, uh, reference materials, like you said, the <laughs> 19,000 pages, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot on the standard setting side and then helping them, helping them create that new future. It is. Well, first of all, uh, give your, uh, your associate a, a pat on the back for me and thank him for talking about that. We have on the ASME website, you see what we're doing in terms of sustainability. Uh, we've always been a big part of the, the push at the UN. And quite frankly, you know, with our programs, whether in, in Africa or India or in, in other emerging countries, um, it all starts with the basics and engineers, we've got a, a group of younger engineers in a program that we call our Engineering for Change Fellowship, where we, uh, we, we do a contest each year in terms of different designs that, uh, that would work, very simplistic designs that will work in rural parts of the world. Uh, how do you, you know, filter water? How do you heat uh, a small home in the Andes in Peru? Uh, and do it very economically. It all comes out of that initiative. So it's a great part. The only thing that I'm disappointed with going to Manhattan College, it was the Christian brothers that, that I learned from. So it's a whole different group. <laughs> well, clerk, men of the cloth, nonetheless. Men of the cloth, <laughs> nonetheless. You know, we've, we've hosted a number of people uh, over the last year and a half on our Leading Entrepreneurs of the World uh, platform here. And, and probably the most common theme we run up, we run up with is sustainability. Mm -hmm. In all different walks of life, it, it's it's so important. It, it, it's front and center in everything in everything we do. And when you tie it into the business community as well, uh, in the investing world, people are looking to have portfolios that kind of emulate that, mm -hmm. model that. Uh, people uh, from a stakeholder standpoint, your employees, uh, your, your folks that are working with you, they they want to often be part of organizations that model that type of behavior. Have the same type of uh, same type of feelings along those topics as well, uh, and, and it just becomes it becomes a much more engaged workforce then, and everybody everybody winds up winning. I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I would agree with you. I, I, I like what you guys are doing, uh, and again, if, if there's a point where you, you you'd like to see some of the stuff for the um, augmented reality. Uh, 
uh, programs. I, I'd love to show you. I'd love to show you. We could do it in our offices in New York City, but uh, and maybe we do it around sometime when the UN is in, in full uh, full uh, cycle. But well, that's usually that's usually the fall, right? That's the general yeah. the general yeah. general assembly. And so when you can't either get a hotel room or a parking spot in New York, <laughs> no, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. <laughs> for sure, right? Yeah. Well, this, Tom, thanks thanks for joining us today. What tr tremendous work you're doing. Um, thank thank you for for for, for taking the lead. In all that you're doing here, and and working working all of these different aspects into your ASME uh, membership base here, and and you're training you're training you're training our future, which is really really important. And you're helping you're helping you're helping students and and engineers around the world kind of look forward, always never forgetting where they come from, but always looking forward with their with their best foot forward. So thank you for that. Well, um, thank you, Glenn. You know the uh, the. I, uh, I'm, I'm new to ASME only four years and I had, this is the third time I've come, fourth time I've come out of retirement because I was bored to death and I decided this time it's time to give back. So I'm having a, a, a great time. And what, what we do best is meeting individuals and, like yourself and organizations and putting everybody together saying together, we're going to make a much better world. And it's truly is happening. So thank Thanks. you. Thanks for lending, lending a hand with that. And we, and we look forward to a continued relationship in the future. So listen, thanks for joining us again today, Tom. Tremendous topic, great presentation, and you're doing some fabulous work. Thank you. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Just the, the website? Yeah, the website or, uh, you know, again, uh, <clears throat> our, uh, asme.org, and yes. I'm all over the place there. So drop me an email. Um, I've got a couple of QR codes up there, but that's easy to do. All right. Look forward to staying in touch. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you, Glenn. Have a good day. Take care. See you next time. Bye.